For Criminal Media's Policy, this is Sane Zamini. Joining me today is a researcher at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, Jenny Irish Koboshiane, to discuss a report she wrote titled Extortion or Transformation, the Construction Mafia in South Africa. So Jenny, you have written up a detailed report about the workings of the so-called uh, construction mafia in our country. What does uh, the construction mafia do and how does it operate? Okay, I think that what the construction mafia, I think there's been quite a lot of media attention around it, but I think if you look at what we defining as a construction mafia, it's those groups of people, often calling themselves local business forums, that go on to construction sites, invading construction sites, often heavily armed, more often than not heavily armed, sometimes carrying even semi-automatic firearms, and are actually extorting things from the construction site. So I think you need to distinguish between communities that are asking to participate in construction projects and construction mafia who are going there and saying, we demand at gunpoint that you give us maybe 30% of the project either in cash or in, in contract value and employ certain people on the sites. Most of this has been happening. It started in case at, at Inumlazi and Guamashu under the banner of a radical transformation. Tell us about the political links of these groupings and forums. I think we identify in our report a number of political links. I think in KwaZulu-Natal, We've seen particular links surfacing between certain politicians and people involved in the local business forums. In particular, at one point, the then mayor of Durban had very close relationship with certain people involved in some of these activities. Um, so on the one hand, you have those kind of direct political links to some of the politicians. But on the other hand, I think we've seen these business forums start to engage in local government and want to start demanding things from local government representatives and threatening some of those local government representatives and even identifying particular candidates that they would like to see in local government. Now that you've mentioned uh, the former Etegwini mayor, we know that uh, from your report, these groupings, uh, they managed to hold a service delivery in Etegwini municipality. Was that somehow linked to the former mayor? I think that I think you might be referring to where they actually invaded a disciplinary hearing in the Etiguini municipality, where a certain person in the senior manager in supply chain management was being disciplined for involvement in tender corruption, and members of local business forums invaded that disciplinary hearing, demanding that it cease um, and that the person be reinstated. That wasn't the only incident. You had a similar incident happening in the Department of Health where there was an intervention team with Provincial Treasury to look at some of the tender corruption happening in the Health Department and a meeting of the Health Department and the Provincial Intervention Team was also invaded by local business forum people demanding that they cease their operations. And why has it been so difficult to apprehend those involved in, in this uh, construction mafia? And they seem to operate with impunity. I think that's one of the issues that we raise in the report, is that it shouldn't be difficult to deal with the construction mafia people. They arrive on site armed, they're often on site for long periods of time, the police get called to those sites. But in addition to that, there have been more than 51 interdicts. Uh, granted. In those interdicts, they actually name specific people, they name the type of um, intimidation taking place. And one of our recommendations is that if we're going to deal with this construction mafia, there needs to be a criminal justice response and people involved in such activities need to be dealt with. Clearly, the law is failing to cap this trend if more than 51 courts interdict have done little to deter these forums. There have been a few arrests but very limited number of arrests, and some of the key ring leaders have not been included in those arrests. And in the report, uh, Jenny, you also revealed that there are taxi industry people who are also having a role to play. Would you briefly share how they uh, are involved in these groupings? I think that happens in two ways. I think the one thing is that some of the people involved in local business forums have a direct link to the ta certain taxi association leadership. And by their own admission, they make use of the taxi industry to assist in their own internal disciplinary processes. 
But I think also, as we saw agreements being reached between some of the local business forum federation, uh, between FRET, for example, the Federation for Radical Economic Transformation, and people in the construction sector, one of the things that was identified to us by people in the construction sectors, while they might have had agreements, splinter groups started to emerge and there was taxi involvement in those splinter groups. Your report also mentions that um, in the beginning there, there were two of these mafia groupings and they nearly fought uh, with each other before realizing that uh, they shared a common interest. Tell us about that. That's correct. I mean, I think that that from from what we from the information we were able to access and glean, there was serious competition between the two groups. A showdown was going to happen, and one of the groups had the involvement of taxi people even at that stage in that showdown. And when they met, they realised that they knew the some of the same people, they had some of the same common objectives, and they actually agreed to come together and form the Federation for Radical Economic Transformation. And you also say these forums, they even managed to delay the repair work following the 2021 uh, July unrest. Yeah, I think there were elements amongst the uh, elements that would definitely still be defined as part of the construction mafia, that mm -hmm. actually when there was rebuilding efforts taking place, in particularly in KwaZulu-Natal, and even to some extent in Kauteng, who went on site and demanded their stake in that rebuilding process. And now these groupings are no longer, Jenny, as you've just mentioned, Pretoria, they're no longer operating in KZN only. Is there a fear from what you've gathered uh, that this could be like in the whole country now? I think they are in the whole country. Um, I don't think it's just a fear. I think the reality is they are operating across the country now. There have been a number of incidents in the Eastern Cape, Western Cape, Kauteng, in Pumalanga, across the provinces, almost every province is being affected by this. And I think that that's not unique. I think our international research on extortion shows that when extortion seems to succeed, um, you have copycat incidents arising elsewhere around the country. And have you ever maybe heard of incidences where maybe the, the people who are awarded these uh, tenders don't want to cooperate with these groups? Yes, there have been incidents of that. There was one small black construction um, operator who was actually killed. Um, I think what we're seeing now is that in the past, we saw an incredible amount of violence linked to this, where the construction mafia elements were flexing their muscles and saying, if you don't cooperate, these are the repercussions. There, in the Western Cape, we've seen two workers that have been injured, and I think one was killed. But I think what we're starting to see is out of desperation, more and more people in the country are saying, we'll just comply, because it's easier for us to comply than face the repercussions of not complying. And our concern is that what happens in that context is that extortion becomes normal, a normal practice. And one senior person in the construction sector that we interviewed said, they've even included this as a budget line item to have to actually accommodate um, this kind of extortion. The long-term implications for the construction industry are serious because in the long term, it becomes untenable to work in that situation. But it also contributes to the normalization of extortion practices in the country. Mm. We have also received reports since we produced the, the report. We have received input from some of the other sectors, say sectors in society, mining, et cetera, saying they are facing similar experiences. From what we've read in your report, Jenny, in 2019, you say close to 200 projects uh, worth more than 63 billion were affected across the country. Is this also like a, another way of ailing our economy? I think it definitely has very serious implications for the economy, and I think we highlight that in the report. I think it also has very serious implications for service delivery to communities. When low-cost housing projects are, are coming to a standstill as a result of this, it affects ordinary people on the ground. And how has it also like caused some backlogs in, in terms of service delivery? We have a number of projects that we've identified in our report which have been standing for almost two years. Now, obviously, those are critical low-cost housing projects that need to be taking place that are unable to take place because of this type of extortion and the violence related to that extortion that is going on at those sites. I think we are saying that there's more that the government needs to be doing around this issue. 
I think we've identified a number of initiatives that we feel need to take place. And that's also based on our international experience because the global initiative does work internationally on extortion. And we're saying that the government needs to take a firm control on looking at how the criminal justice responds to the construction mafia, including investigations, proper investigations and prosecutions of people involved, and a standard for looking at how do they respond when they arrive on site and find that there are people armed and intimidating people on sites. Um, but we're also saying that government needs to start developing partnerships. Part international experience shows that when you're dealing with this extent of extortion, it works best if there are partnerships involved in, in dealing with that extortion. And that would include both communities and the businesses affected and government and local government, because local government are often worst affected by this. We believe that government needs to play a central role in building partnerships in terms of responding to this. And there are examples in other countries, in Italy, where we all know the mafia is very strong and there has been major, major extortion taking place. They initiated a campaign called Farewell to Extortion, which was translated, loosely translated, was Farewell to Extortion, where they involved government, communities, and businesses, and where their businesses and government came together and said, we refuse to accept this kind of extortion that is taking place. And communities also came on board and said, we support the initiative. And people that refused to cooperate with extortionists were given the necessary support to be able to do that. And that campaign was incredibly successful. We also feel that there needs to be a mechanism where people can report extortion. So you've mentioned that you've had conversations with the people in construction sector who were affected by uh, these kinds of extortion. But have you had any conversations with the actual people who are maybe leading these mafia groupings? In the process of compiling our research, we did meet with representatives from FRET. We also met with some individuals involved in local business forums, yes. What is the main reason for them to enter in these kinds of activities? See, a lot of them would justify their actions in terms of saying that they need to be economically included in the projects. And we say in our report, we don't deny that there is a need for the construction industry to look quite seriously at the involvement, local community participation in projects. And that doesn't always happen the way it should happen. But you need to distinguish between local communities that have genuine grievances around how things are happening and people that come on site some of whom don't even come from that local community that specific local community and demand a stake in the project um, and you need to distinguish between the two um, and that's something that we highlight quite seriously in our report that was a researcher at the global initiative against transitional organized crime jenny irish koboshiane to discuss a report titled extortion or transformation, the construction mafia in South Africa.